Hello and welcome back to Nine Compete. I'm American Johnson, and today I'm a little gussied up. I got my hair gelled back. I got my Swiss watch on instead of the $10 proletarian Casio I usually wear. Reason being, I am attempting to channel my inner capitalist. I'm trying to reach deep within into those cryptic locked away segments of my brain that I used to access on a daily basis when I myself was a capitalist. I've run many businesses in my life. Some of them were very successful, others less so. And I've had a lot of employees. Reason I'm bringing this all up is because today we are engaging with the words and ideas of a current capitalist who goes by the name of Rudy with Alpha Investments. Now, Rudy has sort of a YouTube channel, but also a, a business empire, mostly pertaining to the game of Magic the Gathering. Now, don't click away just yet. You don't actually have to know anything about Magic the Gathering at all to watch this video. Uh, it, really, what we're talking about are much more abstract ideas related to capitalism. But the reason that, that Rudy drew my attention and the reason that I'm presenting his words and, and, and actions and ideas to you today is because... Rudy is a special sort of capitalist. Uh, Rudy really um, stands out from the crowd in my mind. I've watched a lot of his videos. Uh, he is incredibly honest. He is an honest capitalist. He tells you exactly how it is in his mind. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to gloss over or sugarcoat anything. He tells you exactly how he feels about capitalism, about investing, in a way that I find somewhat refreshing in this really kind of twisted, disturbing way. In a lot of ways, Rudy reminds me a lot of myself back when I was a capitalist. I considered, well, in, in, in some ways, Rudy's more honest than I was, at least with himself, because I considered myself to be sort of an, an enlightened capitalist. And uh, I believed that, you know, what I was doing was creating jobs and, and, and creating opportunities for my employees. Whereas Rudy... Rudy really seems to see the dark side of capitalism and he embraces it. So uh, uh, just to let you know, I, I want to make this clear. This isn't really a takedown of Rudy or Rudy's channel. It's also not a defense. It's I, what, I, what I hope to do here is just present these ideas and show them to you kind of in their naked form uh, and supplement them a little bit with my own experiences because Rudy's mostly talking about like retail business and online business and investment kind of stuff. Uh, I have some experience with some of those aspects of those businesses, but I also have some experience that doesn't overlap with Rudy's. So like I've also got, I, I ran service-based industries and that, and that sort of thing. So we will just uh, go through, listen to what Rudy has to say, unpack it, and maybe learn a thing or two along the way. So first, let's just get an idea of Rudy's political perspective. And uh, Rudy is, you know, considers himself apolitical. I don't give a shit about politics. I don't like it. I think they generalize people into certain categories. The left versus the right thing is really stupid because there are things on the left I agree with. There's things on the right I agree with. There's things in the middle I agree with. There's things on all three sides I think everyone's stupid. I, so I don't agree labeling everybody into a certain category is very beneficial. Therefore, I've never liked politics. I still don't. I probably never will. Even in the future when we have whole different people involved and there's no Hillary Trump stuff, I still won't like politics. not going to make any difference to me. I think it's all stupid. I think it's all corrupt. There's a lot of underlying hidden things. Same thing with Wizards of the Coast. Same thing with corporate America. It's about who you know. It's about nepotism. There's a lot of people like that. What you're born into. If, are you a trust fund baby? It comes to that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, I don't fit any of that stuff. I never really gave a shit about any of that. I don't fit into the molds of all that stuff. And quite frankly, don't give a... I just don't care. So yeah, Rudy is right where I was about five years ago when I was deep in the throes of my uh, privileged, apolitical, centrist... Everyone on all sides are idiots uh, mindset. I went through that phase for a few years. Um, but so this isn't really so much about Rudy's politics uh, as much as it's about Rudy's perspective on capitalism. So let's get a taste for that perspective. Let's see what Rudy has to say about capitalist industries, specifically Wizards of the Coast, which is the corporation that manufactures this game, Magic the Gathering, which Rudy invests in. And just to set this up, uh, Wizards of the Coast has for a long time been engaging in shady uh, anti-consumer practices, you know, as corporations are wont to do. And uh, Rudy explains how and why corporations engage and the employees of corporations engage in these kinds of nefarious practices. Hasbro is saying, you need to make us damn money. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to keep making damn money. And why do people have a hard time accepting it's business? It's not 
Wizards versus the players. It's the business world. They're shareholders. It's publicly traded. There's equity in debt markets. They have board of directors. If they don't produce, they get fired. It's not their fault. It's like when these banks in Wall Street do shady shit and then they get fired or they're in the news for doing something. These people aren't bad people. These people are getting pressure from higher up or from Wall Street or shareholders to perform or do certain things. And if they don't, they get fired anyways. They lose their job anyways. So they sit down and they go like this. Okay. We don't want to go back to doing U1s and U2s and C2s and all that crap because it's too confusing for the player base. We don't want to do it. Okay. So but the problem is, uh, Bob over there, um, you've been coming in on Sundays and if you don't hit your goal, we're going to fire you. But you can't do anything shady because we'll, we'll, you can get fired too. So let me get this straight. If I don't hit the numbers because I do everything legit and by the book, you're going to fire me. So if I do something shady and try to hit my goal, uh, I run the risk of getting caught and breaking the rule of the company or the law and I get fired. So either way, the outcome in the Venn diagram and the decision tree, if you guys want to be all corporate bullshit in your face, you know, either way, the outcome is you have a probability of getting fired on any given month when you're in that culture. So at the end of the day, you might as well throw the damn dice. And if you get lucky and you don't get tagged, guess what? You're going to hit your goal. You're going to get a bonus. You're going to keep your job. Okay. If you didn't take the risk, guess what? You didn't hit your goal. They're going to fire you anyways. If you did, if you do take the risk and it goes wrong, you still get fired. So you have three possible outcomes, two of which are bad. So you might as well go for the one good outcome. So now hopefully you see what I mean when I say that Rudy's a very honest capitalist. Uh, he, he very eloquently, I believe, explained and outlined exactly how corporations and capitalists put pressure on employees to do bad stuff, to do harm for that profit motive. And in addition, as we will see in just a second, Rudy also deeply understands how capitalist employers just grind us down and, and inflict alienation upon us. And uh, let's just hear what Rudy has to say about what it's like to work in the capitalist system. It's not when you work for companies and work for corporations that, yes, they steal your soul and just destroy you from the inside out. But the problem is when you work full time for these big companies, what happens is by the time you get off work at the end of the day and you watch my videos at night, you are so effing tired and psychologically drained of creativity. You don't have the ability to go home at night and focus and just draw up ideas and try to be creative. Think outside the box. In these companies, I don't know what it is, but when I worked for these firms and different corporations, for some reason, by the time you get off work, you're done. That's why everybody goes out and drinks after they work for these companies. And they have team meetings and team outings to help build the culture and everybody be friendly. And help keep morale up. Because, you know, morale is the number one destroyer of corporations. It spreads like a flipping virus. So, you know, that's... But it's really weird. That's why a lot of people, when they get in these little hamster wheels of these companies, they don't have the ability to jump off the wheel and do their own thing. Because the wheel's spinning. They're used to that rhythm. And if they jump off, they trip and fall. And it's like they absorb your creativity. Even if you're making 50, 60, even 100,000 a year, you're, you're cracking six figures. Even if you make that, you know, before taxes, you know, for some reason, by the time you get off work, there's nothing left of you. You're driving home, you're like this. I mean, you're just dead on the inside. So obviously, Rudy is not a proponent of working for capitalists within this exploitative system. He, he probably wouldn't call it alienation, but I think he described very well a lot of the processes and, and side effects of worker alienation and the way that capitalist employers are just these meat grinders that just wear us down. So uh, Rudy's advice as a capitalist would be for you to go out and start your own business. If you don't like being an employee, if you don't like your boss taking money out of your paycheck every week, go out and hang up your shingle and start your own business. Um, but as you can see, it's not really that easy. And as a former capitalist, this is something that I like to stress as often as I can. It's just not the case that under capitalism, anyone can go out and start a business. It takes capital to become a capitalist. So first, Rudy's going to talk about starting a brick and mortar retail store. And that's just the beginning, okay? Because we're going we're gonna to talk about all kinds of different forms of entrepreneurship. But let's just see what it takes to start a bare bones, minimal, basic 
retail store under capitalism? I want to talk about opening the game store, opening the local card store, and uh, opening a video game store, vintage, books, strategy guides, whatever, whatever you want to open. For the most part, most people, due to the cost of building inventory and getting the ground floor and deposits and fees and hookups and different things, um, it's extremely difficult and the odds are really stacked against you to really turn a profit within 12 to 18 months. I'm just being honest. I've seen people do it. Majority of people, they don't. And as we all know, in my personal opinion, as the distributor has informed me, 70% of people, period, don't make it past a year probably going to get the rent on the place for at least if you're in Florida depending on what part you are it could be as low as a thousand bucks a month or maybe to two thousand a month in a more cheaper realistic cost so if your utility bill let's say is averaging let's say three or four hundred a month I'd say you're probably looking at let's say two or three hundred a month between you know just phone a cell phone if you want for the business you know high-speed internet remember high-speed internet. all these items are more expensive because it's in a commercial business area they say, oh, okay, so you want internet. Oh, wait, that building. Oh, that's for making money building. Therefore, we're going to charge you double. So if you're going to work by yourself with no employees, no labor, no payroll, you know, none of that shit, you're going to do it all by yourself. We're at $2,600 a month for the basic principle. And now let's say, of course, you want to throw in, you know, you want to be legit. Business license, tax exempt certificate, so you need a resale certificate. And then let's say you want to actually have business insurance, crap like that. So let's add just 100 bucks a month or 200 a month, depending where in the country you're located. Puts us 2,700 a month total. So we have a basic, basic bare bones overhead of you're going to work by yourself and maybe your significant other, your family. You're at $2,700 a month, and that's with you starving to death and your family falling over because you're not paying anybody anything. $2,700 a month rent, okay? Which means that you're also going to have a $2,000 deposit right up front, which means right out of the gate, to open the very first day just to have an empty room you're looking at almost five grand now two thousand plus twenty seven hundred you're at forty seven hundred dollars already and you haven't even bought any inventory you can open up the sign and unlock the door someone could come in you don't even have anything to sell what the hell are you gonna do then sell them on hopes and dreams shit so exactly so five grand right there five grand in the bank you got an empty room no build out no counters, no fixtures, no chairs, no tables. Hell, probably don't even have working light bulbs, bathroom facilities, actual a point of sale terminal, either a, some sort of credit card, anything. You got to have everything set up. This is a basic empty room. You are now owner or temporary owner of a $5,000 right out of the gate and you got an empty room. That's where we stand so far in this video. So at this point, You've committed yourself that you can't do any other job to make some additional side income or anything else because you're going to have to work substantial hours to get this off the ground. Okay, so if you're, that means you can't work part time at Taco Bell making an extra couple hundred dollars a week to help pay for your card Timmy's game store. You can't do it because you're going to have to devote all your time, all your focus, and everything into getting this thing off the ground. Now, before we cut this video off here, you're going to probably want another probably a couple thousand dollars in counters fixtures, tables, chairs, you're probably going to be looking at, to do it nicely, another couple grand. Easy. I'd be surprised if you can buy nice glass counters for a big unit and the shelves and the tables and the chairs for under a thousand, two or three. Personally, I think it's probably going to be like five grand just in all the fixtures for a whole store. So now we're going to fast forward. Five plus five, we're at $10,000 in capital to get find a unit, open the first day, and put fixtures in it. Congratulations, you now have a working shell with nothing for sale. And we're out 10 grand already. So we're at 10 grand, probably 15 grand if you want to count the sign that has to be up in the first few months. And that's all we are. That would be the basic entry steps to get off the ground. And we haven't even sold anything, we haven't bought anything, you haven't dealt with a shitty customer, you haven't dealt with anything, man. Again, all these little things are costs that people don't quite fully think about. All everybody thinks about is, no, 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 Rudy, I just want to do this. It's my dream. And that's fine. But you don't realize the capital, how strenuous it is. So, we got everything set up except inventory. We need shit to sell. I think I've been in probably 10 game stores in my entire life. Out of the 10 stores I've been in, only three of the 10 stores 
in my opinion, were legitimate and I knew would stand the test of time. Most of them, I knew they weren't going to make it. The stores were terrible. You walk in there, half the room's empty. There's a poster on the wall. There's one little case with like one booster box of Oath of the Gate Watch or something. And I'm like, and there's two people in the corner playing magic. I'm like, dude, this place ain't going to make it. There's no way they're going to foot that overhead. Remember, 2000 a month plus miscellaneous, 2700 a month in overhead. There's no way they're going to foot 2700 a month overhead. And that's with no payroll. That's with them working by themselves. The owner and his significant other, and maybe you have your family being slave labor for free. They're not going to make it. You can't foot the bill for that. You've got to have inventory. You've got to be diversified. You've got to be able to have capital available. Whether you're going to leverage yourself and borrow, ugh, dangerous stuff. Or you're going to have a bunch of money in the bank and you're ready to tackle this shit. Rudy, how much money should I have in the bank? How much should I put for inventory for the first day? What should I buy? Well, you're not going to like my answer and a lot of people aren't going to agree with me. If I had to open up a card, hobby, video game, book, vintage, re any form of retail store today, and I was brand new, I don't think I would personally open the store with less than $50,000 in the bank. And when I say $50,000 in the bank, I mean $50,000 not in my personal checking account. I mean in a separate Timmy's Game Store checking account that I'm going to know I'm going to spend all that money cannot be used for my personal use, my family, my house, my mortgage, my rent, my utilities, uh, if I have a car payment or insurance or home phone, cable bill, whatever. I'm talking a separate account with 50000 And I know a lot of people won't agree with me, but I'm going to tell you how I feel because I will not engage in a certain business transaction or a certain amount of risk unless I'm comfortable with it and I have a buffer. You need a lot of cash flow to make it work. So you can take the hits when there's problems. Theft from an employee or theft from a customer or people hosing you online. So what happens is even when an opportunity comes up, you can't seize the moment. I mean, what if somebody comes in your store and they drop a big pile of old stuff on your, your desk? And you look at it, there's all these random factory sealed dual decks from years. All of them. Tons of them. All these old ones. Everything. There's piles of them. And you go, wow, this is really great. I'd love to buy these. I'll give you like 10 or 12 bucks a dual deck and, or 15 store credit, whatever. And then below that, you see a pile of old vintage, you know, Super Nintendo games. Factory sealed with the Y fold or the H seam. And, you know, you go, oh my God. And he wants like two or 3000 for it. And you know you can probably sell them for 10000 Well, guess what? If you don't have the money, you just missed out on probably one of the best opportunities for your business in a long time. So, back to reality. 50000 is what I personally would do for a game store. If I'm going to open up a card, a video game, a vintage anything, I want 50 G's in cash available liquidity. So if I get a conspiracy set and I'm down 10 grand after a month, you know, I got to flip the other 10 grand until the money comes back, you need to be prepared for it. 50K to me is my minimum number. I wouldn't open a store with less than 50 available extra. Remember, inventory, cash management, don't run out of liquidity. You run out of liquidity, Timmy's Game Store will be no more. So there you go, tens of thousands of dollars. And the average worker in America works paycheck to paycheck, has $1,000 or less in the bank, $6,000 in credit card debt, and uh, makes about $30,000 per year. So, you know, yeah, and if you look at the statistics, the average startup business in America costs about $30,000 to start, so um, which is even less than Rudy's minimum. And Rudy's saying that if you're undercapitalized, you're probably gonna fail, which is true, because the most common reason businesses fail is undercapitalization. That means not having enough money to make cash flow, not having enough money to capitalize on opportunities. So if you don't have tens of thousands of dollars, you're never gonna make it in a brick and mortar retail business. I used to run a brick and mortar retail business. Uh, we probably invested about thirty or forty thousand dollars in our business, and making that cash flow is just as difficult as Rudy said it would be. And we were just—I mean, we were saving money every way we possibly could. Um, you know, retail is obviously a very expensive endeavor to undertake. You're going to have to have a huge bankroll to do it and have any chance of being successful. So I know what you're saying. You're saying brick and mortar is—you know 
it, of course, it's out of the reach of most people. Of course, most people aren't going to be able to go out and get a $2,000 a month lease or whatever. That's why nowadays we have all these new opportunities, these ways of bootstrapping our businesses. Like you could start an online business and you could, uh, you know, overnight, you can set up a shop on Amazon or eBay or something like that and, and get into business for yourself. So let's see what Rudy, who is an experienced online retailer, has to say about selling things online. No matter what you do, there are literally people, again, I've said it five times already, they just want to hose you. Whether it's because they, they just need the money, they don't believe in capitalism, there is no way, I'm going to be very blunt with everyone up front, there is no way to actually remove these risks. You cannot get around it. You're going to get burned, people are going to hose you, you're going to get screwed over. You need to accept that going into it. Which brings us to number one, you must budget for fraud. You must figure out whatever items you're selling. You personally, I use a 1 in 100 transaction defect fraud rate. Therefore, if you're only making a dollar a box, you sell 100 boxes and 1 in 100 boxes screws you over, you're not, you're not going to do well. You must make sure you are budgeting for the losses and for the people are going to hose you. It's not if, but it's how many people and when it happens. You have to be ready for it. And you must leave emotion out of this whole thing. If you just get too emotional, you're too wound up, you're gonna get you're gonna get slaughtered. Then you go online, you start realizing that everyone's already doing it, and everything's only selling for pennies on the dollar. Literally, the price you get from a distributor for a sealed box of Eldritch Moon, because you've been in business two years now, you're getting the box for $78 shipped to your, from the distributor. You go online, they're selling for, on eBay for $90. After shipping and fees, you're going to lose $1.50 or you're going to make $1.50 depending on where it ships to. And you go, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? What am I going to do? Hire someone to do online? Pay them $10 an hour to make a dollar a box? And then pray and hope they don't hose you on eBay and it's not a scam not going to work very well and you get burned a lot you know if you don't have tracking for small orders even if you have tracking people will say oh it got damaged and they ship it back and it's not even the same thing you mailed and there's nothing you can do it's no different when then when customers come in your store or if you have a bunch of people in here people are going to steal from you period you're going to have loss so yeah just like he said it's a very risky endeavor to start an online business just as it is to start a brick and mortar business just because you don't have these expenses of like having a, a, a lease or you know having to pay for your electrical bill and all that stuff every month doesn't mean you're not going to have tremendous expenses tremendous exposure and risk you know you're, you're risking a lot of money and there are a lot of ways to lose it very very fast in the online business world I have done online business myself, and in addition, I've been a marketing consultant for probably 30 or 40 different online retailers, and they're losing money constantly to fraudulent returns. They're losing money to fees. I mean, the fees that are getting taken out of every online transaction is just tremendous, and the competition online is extraordinary. I mean, of course, everyone wants to go and, and do business online if they can because they don't want to have those brick-and-mortar expenses. So you've got, you know countless competitors out there and 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 a lot of them are much much bigger than you and when it comes to selling things retail it's all about volume you know you want to be able to buy as much as you can so you can get your cost basis down as much as possible so that you can make as much profit as you can for each transaction so that's why companies like amazon they're selling like millions and millions and millions of little tiny things per day and they're able to make money because they have all that volume if you're starting out bootstrapping yourself it's very, very difficult to break into that kind of business. And, and Rudy didn't even go into the marketing costs. You know, if you, if you, if you don't want to have to pay those eBay fees and those Amazon fees, you're going to have to set up your own web shop. And that means you're going to have to spend a lot of money on marketing. I mean, there's, there are t-shirt businesses here in Vietnam that are run pretty much as bare bones as can be. I mean, like minimal investment. And they're, they're having to drop, I mean, most of my clients were dropping thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month just on like Facebook and Google ads to sell these t-shirts. So online retailing requires a lot of capital as well to have any hope for success, right? So here's, what, here's why this is a problem for an average worker who doesn't have tens and tens of thousands of dollars in the bank. It's impossible to compete with, with larger people unless you have that capital. And having that kind of capital is literally like nothing 
for a very wealthy millionaire or billionaire. If you have somebody who does have a trust fund who, who or who's you know just a billionaire from exploiting other people or even just a millionaire, the risk that they're undertaking is exponentially, like monumentally lower than what you as a bootstrapping person using your life savings is going to undertake. So if you're going out, you're risking $50,000. If you lose it, you lose everything. You're betting the farm. That is a terrible idea, as Rudy will now explain. You get some people who are flipping investments and doing things, and then they're so good at it, what ends up happening is they get too cocky or confident, and they keep adding more and more risk. So they'll flip 10, 20 transactions or stocks, and they make money. And then on the 21st one, they'll lose... And that one loss on the 21st transaction will undo all the gains they've had for the last, you know, five years because they keep leveraging upwards and betting the farm. And that's always a term that always made me nervous. Like before I make an investment or think about life, I always ask myself, if this, if this goes bad, is it going to take down the system? Does it have the ability to really, you know, wreck the whole house of cards? Are you, are you leveraged so high where if the reserve list went away, would I literally have to go back to working at Taco Bell and get a real job at good old, you know, Walmart or something? Now, I'm just going to fill in a little bit of a gap here because one thing Rudy doesn't talk about ever is, is starting a service business. So something, you know, something like starting a digital marketing agency or a web development company or a graphic design firm or something like that. And Rudy doesn't talk about that. I don't know if Rudy has experience in those kinds of businesses or not. I have a lot of experience with that. That's how I made the most money in my career was through services. And I will tell you this right now. It's exactly the same situation. If you don't have the capital, you cannot start a successful, thriving service business. You can become a freelancer and become highly, heavily exploited because freelancers are some of the most exploited workers in the entire economy. And I say this as a former freelancer as well. Uh, freelancers get just like the worst deal most of the time because we don't get any of the protections or benefits of being an employee. We get treated like garbage. We're often working for free and doing free labor for people. We don't get compensated for any of the, you know, generally speaking, we don't get compensated for the planning or for the meetings and all that kind of stuff. So, yes, you can start your little, like, like freelancing operation, and, and you might be able to just squeak by. And some people will thrive, obviously. Uh, but that's not the same thing as starting a business. And if you want to start a service business, then we're talking about, Human resources. I love that capitalist evil expression. Human resources. You must have these humans as your resources to consume. Uh, so anyway, yeah. If you're if you're starting a service business, that's all about people. You know, you, you're you're investing quote unquote in people, and what that means is you got to be paying people way less than you're taking in. Okay. Um, not just to cover for overheads and stuff like that, but if you want to make like, so, so let, if, when I ran my video production company, this is, I'll just use a, a concrete example. You know, if I wanted to make uh, 500 bucks a day just to like pay the bills and, and keep the lights on and all that kind of stuff and, and keep my equipment in good condition and all that kind of stuff, you know, I'd have to hire somebody and pay them like $10 an hour. I'd have to charge $50 an hour to do that. Okay. Um, in order to do that, you have to have all the nice equipment, okay? You can't go out and charge a client $50 per hour for a video shoot or $100 per hour. Or sometimes we were charging like $500 an hour depending on what we were doing. You can't charge that if you don't have the fancy cameras, all the equipment, the software, everything legit. You have to have like the real legit versions of the software so that you can work with, because you have to work with other vendors a lot. So if somebody's like, oh, well, we got this other person who shot, you know, this footage in New York, they'll send you the footage. If I have a cracked version of Premiere, or Final Cut or whatever, I'm not going to be able to open that. There's a very high chance I'm going to be able to open that footage. So you have to have the real software. You know, when you're doing things as a business where you have all these different moving pieces and you're trying to charge the kinds of rates you need to charge to be able to properly exploit your employers, that takes a lot of capital investment, okay? So, yeah, you, you no matter how you slice it, no matter what kind of business you're looking to start, if you don't have liquidity, if you don't have the capital, if you don't have the ability to ride those rough waves and take advantage of those opportunities, you're gonna struggle, you're gonna fail. And the numbers say it. Like Rudy said earlier in the video, 70% of card shops fail, not just card shops. According to the numbers, 70% of all businesses fail within around 10 years. And if you're failing after 10 years, that means you have been struggling and having a terrible time of it for that entire time. It's just not a proposition that most people 
can undergo realistically. It's it's worse than gambling. I could go to Las Vegas and I could go to the craps table and I could bet on the pass line with odds and I have a 50-50 chance that I'm going to win on that bet. Okay, so there, there are literally your your chances are better in Las Vegas at the craps table than they are for you to go out and try to bootstrap your own business with your life savings for most for the vast majority of workers on planet Earth. Now, you can increase your chances of success very substantially by having more capital and the more capital you're able to inject into your startup and the more liquidity you have and the more free capital, like Rudy was talking about earlier, the more liquid money. You know, liquid just means it's money that's not invested in like your computer. It's not invested in a camera. It's just cash that's in the bank, ready to go, ready to service your business. If you don't have that kind of liquidity, your chances for success plummet. Okay. So becoming a capitalist under capitalism takes capital. It's a very simple, basic concept. So let's return to the idea of risk and, and the way that a lot of capitalists just glamorize risk and say that the reason that capitalists are entitled to making millions of dollars is because they risk so much. Okay, well, we've already covered the fact that millionaires and billionaires are making much less of a risk anytime they make an investment than you are with your life savings. Okay, that aside, let's say you are a small business person. You go out, you, you invest in this business, you work hard, and you win the lottery. Your, your, your business does really well, and you start pulling in millions. You bootstrap yourself up to success. Therefore, according to the logic of, of capitalists, you are entitled to all of that money that you wrench from your employers, and you're entitled to all of that exploitation that you are committing. Is this really the way that we want, want to run our society? Do we really want to run our society in a way where for you to have any chance of making it, you have to gamble with odds that are worse than what you have in Las Vegas. You have to put everything on the line with competition that can buy and sell you many times over in terms of the liquidity and the assets that they have. I mean, do you really think that this is how we should be pursuing human progress? Does this really sound like a good formula to you? I'm just asking, just think about it, okay? If you're, if you're pro-capitalist and this all sounds good to you, you like the idea of risk, reaping rewards through risk, just think a little bit about it. Is this really honestly the best way that humans can, can structure our society. Is there no better way? Are there, is there nothing better we can do? Okay. I'm just, that's just an open question. I'm just throwing that out there. Probably a topic for a future video, but okay. Let's table that for now. Let's move back to that topic that Rudy brought up way back at the beginning of the video of how capitalism puts pressure on entities and employees to do bad stuff to cause harm. If you're a big, huge, gigantic, wealthy, successful capitalist, you've got this profit motive. You've got these dollar signs in your eyes. You want to make more and you don't want to lose on your investment. So you're going to do whatever it takes to get that profit. That is the sole motivating factor for running a business in our society. You can't have emotion in the game at all. It's got to be cold, calculating, profit-seeking behavior. Anything less than that, you are going to fail. Someone is going to outcompete you Somebody who's more ruthless and willing to do what you're not willing to do is going to put you out of business. So for big established capitalists, it's the profit motive. For small, struggling small businesses that don't have that liquidity that they need, that don't have the capital that they need, that are terrified they're going to lose everything, they have the fear motivation to do things that are a little shady, a little sketchy, to do harm. And let's just hear a little bit more about how capitalists in this capitalist worldview are supposed to make decisions on how to run their business and, and how to pull in those desperately needed profits. You're making a business decision using emotion and you didn't leave emotion at the door and you're being an idiot. And if you do not base your investments on pure logic, I don't care if you agree with the company, disagree, this is a business logical numerical thing. When you make or lose money, there is no emotion in it. It may have a side effect where you may feel a positive or negative response from a neurological brain telling you something, but overall, it is a cut and dry, cold situation. And you have to look at it as a strictly numerical investment digits. It's flipping digits and colors, and people don't do that. So when you're looking at this kind of thing, when you're building portfolios, we have to strictly remove all emotion, how much we want to own something, how much we care about it, and strictly look at it from a blunt, raw number. I guarantee you, you would look at the investment very different if it was just a bunch of numbers on a piece of paper versus a beautiful Urza's box that connects you to your childhood nostalgia. And that is the most difficult thing for people to remember. 
So funny enough, uh, Rudy also has a video on Martin Shkreli, who is that, you know, dirtbag uh, healthcare industry investor who is like jacking up the prices for desperately needed medications. And Martin Shkreli would tell you the exact same thing. For us to try to exist and, and maintain a profit, I think is pretty reasonable. I may not agree with the morals and ethics of individuals and what Martin may do in the pharmaceutical world because it's tied to healthcare, but at the end of the day, I understand what he's doing. You have to make these decisions under capitalism in this cold, calculating, capitalistic manner. If you don't, you're not going to get your profit numbers where they need to be, and you're going to go out of business, or if you're a CEO, you're going to get swapped out for some other more ruthless CEO. That is how capitalism functions. There are, there's no room for ethics in capitalism at all. By design, it is an amoral system. The only thing that all of human industry is, is harnessed to is that profit motive for capitalists. And at the end of the day, any business, whether they're making the video games that you want to play or whether they're making the medicine that you need to live, the people at the top of those business are making decisions based solely on profit motive. And, you know, capitalists can say all day long that what's best for the consumer is what's going to drive profits, but that's not true. And, and we've, we've documented how, how many cases are there where the companies that you do business with every day are screwing you over and you have no choice but to, to just accept it. Accept the fact that you're being exploited. Accept the fact that you're not being dealt with fairly. It's a power imbalance. Capitalism is an engine that produces power imbalances. That's what capitalism is designed to do. It's what it does best. It puts a lot of people in a position of lower power and a few people in a position where they have a great deal of power. That's how capitalism works. And that's how our finance industry works. Now, Rudy has a financial background, knows a lot more about finance and credit cards and all that stuff than I ever will. But even Rudy recognizes how evil the finance industry is, which is such a big part of our lives. You know, And like I said earlier, the average American has $6,000 in credit card debt and less than $1,000 in the bank. So here's, how, here's what Rudy has to say about the credit card industry and how that is just another way of sapping capital from the working class and putting it in the pockets of the wealthy, powerful elite. And we live in a society where if you use your credit card and you, if you have a $1,000 credit limit and you charge over $500 in a month, they will actually lower your credit score because you broke 50% of your credit utilization number. 50% because they operate on ratios. And when you break through certain ratios, they penalize you. If you shop around and pay people pull your credit, they penalize you. If you try to get multiple credit cards to have a lot of emergency situation, you're penalized for thinking ahead. If you try to use your credit card and then six, every six months try to raise your limit, you're penalized. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Everything you do, you are treated like shit. That is the way the banking world works. Whoever designed how and why the system is designed to design and spit out a credit score number is the dumbest system I have ever seen because you're penalized for building credit, building personal safety, and building wealth. You're penalized, at least in the United States. I don't know about you guys overseas. I'm not sure of your system. In the U.S., you are treated poorly. You are given a lower score for trying to better your future. Seriously. Why is it that if you're an individual citizen and you want to take out a loan for $1,000, or you want to take a cash advance, which you should never do, or a credit card interest rate. And if you have good credit, your interest rate may be 5 to 10%. If you have bad credit, it may be 10 to 20%. So explain to me why when you're in the professional and no longer in the amateur category, the more debt you take on, the lower your interest rate is. But when you're a normal citizen or an amateur, non-professional label, that any debt you take on is deemed evil, and the rates are extremely high. But the people over here, the more leverage and debt they take on, uh, they start getting discounts or breakpoints or lower and better deals, and your prices go down. If I borrow $1,000, I pay a 10% interest rate. If I'm a professional and I want to leverage a million-dollar line of credit, or even if I want to go on margin on a brokerage account, and I have $10 million in assets, and I want to go on margin for $2 million. What's funny is that take, if I go on margin and borrow $2 million from a brokerage firm, my interest rate's going to be 2 to 3%, maybe 2.9, maybe 1.9, depending on where you are. Because of the fact you're taking on so much debt, 
they drop your rate to literally some form of prime plus a certain amount of basis points or even prime minus a certain amount of basis points depending on your credit worthiness. So then I don't understand why do we have a double standard? Why is it that a regular citizen, whether you're American or anywhere in the world, when you take on debt, you're considered irresponsible and bad. But if you're a large, powerful, wealthy individual or somebody building an empire, when you take on debt and you're managing it and you're, oh yeah, I just took out $5 million in debt. What's your rate, Rudy? Ah, 2.11. Absolutely. All right. All right. Cheers to that. Let's go do something inappropriate. And I know most of you are going to say, well, Rudy, it's pretty simple, actually. It's because the risk to the firm or the risk of somebody lending you the money is obviously severely reduced. So therefore, they don't need to charge you as much of an interest rate because your default risk is so low. Your credit worthiness is so high. I, I get that to an extent. But it really does go in the face of everything we're told. Because people grow up and are wired a specific method. And that method is that a very blanket statement. Debt is bad. If you're in debt, it's because you're an irresponsible, bad human being. And the thing is... Almost everyone I've met in real life who's been very successful in Wall Street, in derivatives investing, they're, they're buying debt or different instruments, or they're just buying collectibles. Hell, I know people who did cryptocurrency. Anybody. Anybody. Stamp collecting, comic books, vintage cards, whatever you want. Almost every one of these people leveraged and used some form of injected capital or borrowed or some form of leverage of getting extra money and paying a low interest rate to slingshot them to a higher level in society, to maybe bump themselves up one or two socioeconomic classes. They used leverage and they borrowed and took on debt. There you go. So wealthy people are able to use debt in a way that creates more wealth. Whereas working class people, people who don't have a lot of wealth, for us, debt is this weight that we carry around with us throughout our lives. It's this liability. It's this, it's this suffering that we endure. That is the difference between being a working person in a capitalist society and being a wealthy capitalist. For the wealthy capitalist, all of these systems are designed to assist you. All of these systems are designed to promote you, to elevate you. If you have the capital, then you can make more capital. It takes money to make money. It's one of the oldest sayings around, and there's so much truth in it. Versus if you're a working class, poorer person, or or God forbid, if you're in poverty, all of these systems are designed to grind you down, keep you down, keep you from moving out. The, 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 the deck is stacked so heavily against you if you're a working class or a poor person in a capitalist country like the United States of America. It's unbelievable that people still buy into this system. It's so, so lopsided in terms of the power dynamics. And... And the biggest companies, as Rudy, I'll, I'll put in this quick clip, Rudy will talk about. The way that the biggest companies make money is through leveraging debt and through having, you know, tremendous amounts of capital at their disposal so that they can capitalize on whatever situation they're presented with. It gives you so many more options if you have a lot of money. I mean, I know that goes without saying, but that is a, an important, a, a critical component of capitalism is the fact that if you have a lot more money, then you have so many more options in life and in business. I don't know how these companies run their number, but I can guarantee you, G words slapped across my forehead, that most of these large conglomerates operate on business lines of credit, have different cash flows, and they have forms of borrowing and leveraging during peak season, then they get paid off, it gets, you know, they can borrow 100000 it gets paid off, maybe they go up a 10000 down. There is going to be a form of a buffer, of a liquidity, some sort of something they can tap into if there's a major product coming out and they got to spend big or a major collection. All of these companies and conglomerates use lines of credit and have a cost of capital. Now, it is foolish to think you can move up in society without using capital and having any form of leverage. I don't care if you're doing a leverage buyout, you're buying or selling a business. I don't care if you're expanding your inventory. Unless you're a trust fund baby, which unfortunately I wasn't. I wish I was because that would be great to have tons of free money, as everybody can probably agree. And if you don't agree, you're lying to yourself. Unfortunately, 99.9% .9 of all of us, including myself, we were not born into it, which was a crappy thing. So we have to build our own empires. We have to figure out our own way. 
So Rudy knows it. Rudy knows that capitalism is an engine that requires people to be at the bottom and that sucks and siphons wealth from that bottom class and it just shoves it up the ranks to the top. Rudy knows it. Rudy explains it very clearly. And you know what? As a former capitalist who spent a lot of time with other capitalists, we all knew it. We all know it. We all know that once you make it into this capitalist class, once you once you beat those Las Vegas, those worse than Las Vegas odds, you know, and, and, and you make it to the top, everything is going to be designed to support you and to keep you at the top and to, to, to siphon money from your workers, from the workers of the world into your pockets. That is what capitalism does and capitalists celebrate it. There's a reason why money flows in a certain direction, which is usually towards the top or towards the wealthy. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the divide of the class system gets... I, I, I've heard it all. And the thing is, pe most people don't care. If you're even still watching this video this long, I'm already surprised. Most people don't care because they don't know any different. They don't feel like they're doing anything wrong. And I think, and I genuinely believe from my history and past of actually having a real job is that most of this was designed intentionally so that you feel that way. And we need a society like that. We need a high proportionate amount of human beings at a lower socioeconomic class. I don't want to use the term bottom feeders because I don't think it's a very politically correct term, but we need people to churn the machine. We need people to, every dollar they make, they give 10 cents on the dollar to banks for fees, transactions, and paying interest and being in debt. It's a nasty thing, but it's how it is. So that's it for this video. Uh, if, if Rudy ever happens to watch this, I doubt that you will, but if you do, Rudy, you know, hey, I can't really cast much aspersion on you. I was you. I was you not very long ago. Um, from, from watching your videos, I don't know if you're a good person or a bad person. I don't know that it matters. What I, what I will say is I respect your honesty and I'm glad you tell it like it is because it's a great tool of analysis for us, for the workers of the world who want to unite and build a better world. It's great that there are honest capitalists like you who are willing to just lay all the cards on the table. That was a Magic the Gathering joke. And, uh, and tell it like it is. I'm glad that you're so honest. And, I, and I'm glad that there are people like you out there who are willing to soberly and with no emotion just explain how these things work from the perspective of the capitalist class. Because that is a great learning tool for those of us who are in the lower ranks of society and who want to make a better world. So thank you for your honesty, if nothing else. And thank you, whoever you are, for watching. I would love to collect and review more videos like this. So if you have other examples of capitalists who are just like completely honest about how evil the system of capitalism is, please share them in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe. And that's all I got. I'm American Johnson. This is Not Compete. We'll see you next time. At the classroom lectern is Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr., noted young historian. In order to have a proper appreciation of the American economic system, we must know how the national income is divided in America. In other words, we must examine the distribution of the great wealth produced through the operation of American capitalism. Is the distribution widespread, or is the wealth of America concentrated in the hands of a few? as the socialists and communists say. We know that American capitalism is morally right because its chief elements, private ownership, the profit motive, and the competitive market are wholesome and good.